Okay, with uh, this lecture, we're going to go into more detail about zooplankton and the role in um, eating phytoplankton and other organisms. And I think I explained already what this um, uh, thing is sticking into the water, so I won't go over that. So anyway, um, so we talked about uh, how uh, bottom-up factors such as light and nutrients control phytoplankton biomass and prime production. And what we're talking about, of course, today and for uh, next couple of lectures is top-down control, mainly uh, uh, <clears throat> controlled by zooplankton grazing. Um, say a few words about viral lysis um, on Thursday. So these factors, the top-down control factors, um, affect the biomass levels of phytoplankton and other organisms, um, whereas the bottom-up uh, factors affect the growth rates. So we talked already about um, how you can divide up the zooplankton community by, by uh, size. I'll talk a little bit more about that today. We can talk also about how to divide up the, the community by where they live. Um, the holoplankton are always in the water column, whereas the meroplankton are, um, have a, uh, their juvenile stages in the water column, whereas the adults are on the bottom. And you should know now there are two types of meroplankton um, depending on whether or not they have a, 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 a yolk sac that they take with them and don't need to feed versus uh, those that do need to feed in the water column. Very different um, uh, roles in the uh, zooplankton community. And then we kind of had a quick review and, and introduction to the diversity of these animals um, um, and talked about various types of uh, zooplankton that we see in the oceans. So today we're going to come to the fourth way in which we can divide up the zooplankton community, and that is by how they feed. Um, so there's basically four ways in which they feed, um, and you can see their names, and so we're going to go walk through these. Um, the only one that we're not going to talk about today is phagocytosis, which we'll talk um, next lecture. So, um, so the first one is raptorial, which is basically... Um, as indicated on the previous slide, is that you can imagine uh, a lion uh, 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 hunting down a, a gazelle or some other herbivore. Um, basically, these organisms are, 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 are catching their prey and then slicing them up. And so the raptorial uh, filter feeders, raptorial feeders, and they're not filter feeders at all, have very different appendices um, that they use for filtering. So they don't have any hairs or setae to be more uh, scientific about it. Um, that the uh, filter feeders, which are the other type, um, have. So the CTA are these hair-like um, structures on the appendices that help filter out the uh, prey, whereas raptorial uh, feeders do not have that. They basically, again, just kind of hang on to the prey and, and ingest it. So the, the, the filter feeders um, catch the, uh, their prey uh, in between these hair-like structures, the CTA that are found on the zooplankton appendices. So these are uh, appendix, uh, yeah. uh, so anyway, so these are, these are, are, are like a, a mesh that uh, catches the various prey. And we'll see in a moment that they um, have a big impact on the size of the prey that can be captured by these organisms. So here's just a structure of just a, a small video, kind of graining, um, showing, um, uh, how this works in real life. So what you see here on the bottom is basically a poor zooplankton that's been uh, glued to a glass tube um, and it's waving its little arms into the uh, water trying to catch um, some prey. Um, and this this diagram kind of explains well, what's, all, what's going on in that video. So here's another diagram uh, showing basically the same thing a bit cleaner. Um, let's see if I can get this started. I figured this out earlier. See if I so there we go, and and the, the uh, and the 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 paper that's I, I oops, sorry that I got this from um, was a uh, kind of a, a controversy that they're going back and forth about what's most important in, in uh, uh, setting off these guys to start feeding and, and to start the feeding currents, and the authors of this um, paper believe it's it's just the mechanical movement of the prey near the um, near the predator, um, whereas the other uh, authors that um, they were responding to um, argued for uh, chemo sensation and sensing of the prey. Um, probably a little bit of both is happening. So, so to orientate you, these, this is the, let's see if that's still working now, sorry. 
I'm going to get my pen back here. So, so the so the tail of the organism is down here, um, and these are the uh, two antennae uh, of the of the animal. And it's of course again it's 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 glued to this glass tube, um, and so so it allow the uh, the investigators to take a picture. So as I was saying, um, the whole point of the experiment was to look at the role of, of having a prey particle come through here, and that they argue was setting off the currents, setting off the uh, the waving of the animal's uh, appendices to get this to go. And, uh, so yeah. So anyway, um, and so that's so we talked about raptorial. As I said, it's like lions and and, and tigers. Filter feeding, um, they're catching their prey within the small hair-like structures, the setae. Um, the third me mecha mechanism that we're going to talk about today is mucus nets. And these are put out by um, uh, organisms like salps that we talked about, and the pteropods. And basically these are, as the name implies, um, um, nets are, uh, are spun out into the water. And, and, and they uh, catch the prey. And then the animal uh, pulls them back in and to uh, capture the prey and to, uh, of course, eat it. And so that's basically what a mucus net. Very different way of catching prey. And again, has implications for what size of, of prey that these organisms can get after. So again, the, the fourth way that we're, we're going to be talking about, not today, is phagocytosis, which is a very, very different way of feeding than the, all the three that we just mentioned. So these are the three that we already talked about, which you now should understand and know about. Okay, so now let's move into talking about the factors affecting grazing. Um, and there are basically three that we can talk about. Uh, we've mentioned one already, and you've seen some data um, illustrating this first one, that is the size. Size is really important in determining who can eat whom. Um, the, the second factor is, is uh, basically the appearance and the, the taste of the prey, and finally, the third is the numbers of that prey. So size, you've seen this graph before, before but basically big um, zooplankton eat big prey. And likewise, um, small zooplankton eat small prey. And the very rough rule here is 10 to 1. That is, the predators are about tenfold bigger than the prey. Now what's interesting here, though, is that the filter feeders, as I've kind of implied before, fall off the line. That is, they're eating much smaller prey than what you would expect from the 10 to 1 rule. And you perhaps have, uh, know about uh, blue whales, whales in general, or many whales, uh, because of the bal baleen structure, feeding structure, can eat small zooplankton. And, and you should know already that one of the small zooplankton they eat, or small to them, big in the zooplankton world, is krill or the thousands. So those, those zooplankton are... Well, they're big for zooplankton. They're maybe centimeters in size, um, but they're, uh, of course, quite small compared to a whale. Um, on the other end of the scale, we have things like salps. Um, salps are those filter feeders, uh, those mucus, uh, uh, not filter feeders, but rather mucus net feeders. And so they can also catch prey much smaller um, than what we would predict by the uh, 10 to 1 rule. But... Um, there are certainly lots of other um, examples uh, uh, that uh, of, of predators eating things only about um, tenfold smaller than what they are—not a hundredfold or a thousandfold, but tenfold. So, but the basic message here is that size has a big impact on what these organisms can eat. So that this leads to this um, graph that I showed you before. Um, and basically, it's a very simple one, indicating that some predators are going to have a, a, a you know, eat, be able to eat bigger prey than other ones. And they won't be able to eat the very small prey, nor are they going to be able to eat the things that are much, much bigger than, uh, than their optimum size. And similarly, there's going to be another predator that has very different um, optimum in terms of what it can eat. So again, the basic message here is prey size has a big impact on what these organisms can eat. So another factor that affects predation is basically the, the appearance of the prey. And you can just imagine trying to chomp on this diatom with, with, with its spines, or this one um, with its spines. So spines are, are also thought to um, help in keeping the, these rather heavy um, phytoplankton in the water column by creating these kind of floats that help them uh, not sink as fast. So addition to the spines, 
being in a, a chain of diatoms uh, rather than a single cell basically makes you bigger. Um, and, and we've already seen that the uh, size of the prey has a big impact. So I put chains here in terms of the shape, uh, though, I, though in some ways it's more about size as opposed to shape. Certainly spines um, has impact on, on feeding. So another one is it's just the composition of the prey. Um, so, so I mentioned already that, that predators and zooplankton can taste, so to speak. They have, they sense their prey um, via chemical sense, uh, uh, sensing mechanisms. And uh, Poulet was a, uh, or is, I think he's still around, a zooplankton ecologist who, who, who said this, copepods are French, they prefer foods that taste good. Um, I think more than just the uh, French like good food, but anyway, um, you can see the point there. And the evidence for that is the fact that you can fool phytoplankton, uh, zooplankton to eat a plastic bead. So that's, that's a remarkable thing. Again, um, says how important size uh, is. That is, if the, if the plastic bead is about the same size as its regular prey, it will eat it. But it won't eat it as, as, as fast if it's not basically flavored uh, with the uh, phytoplankton extract. So if you uh, present the plastic uh, uh, beads to a zooplankton uh, without the uh, coating of, the zooplankton, of its zooplankton prey, yeah, it will eat it much more slowly than if uh, you coat that plastic bead with, uh, with the, uh, the phytoplankton extract. So that, that, that's a pretty good evidence piece of evidence that, that indicates that the composition of the prey um, has a big impact. It somehow is able to sense the chemical composition, just the outside, not necessarily the inside, but the outside of its prey. Another piece of evidence is that um, you can, you can uh, present um, so these zooplankton of the same size prey, um, different phytoplankton, um, but they won't feed on them the same. So if, if size were the only criteria, um, then you expect exactly the same feeding rate. But in fact, there is a difference in the feeding rate depending on, well, the hypothesis, and, and it seems to be the case, is that their composition. And again, it's the cell, this outside composition, not necessarily what's inside the prey. So the shape of the, of the prey, size, and composition has a big impact. Now, the final thing that, um, that we'll talk about in terms of affecting grazing rates is the numbers of prey. And this is going to lead us into a whole discussion about uh, the main factors affecting zooplankton grazing, uh, functional response and, um, and numerical responses. And so the numbers of prey has a big impact on the functional response and actually the numerical response of these zooplankton to the prey. So I want you to guess um, what this graph should look like. And I mentioned in, in this course, there's really only two sets of, uh, of curves that we talk about. I mean, not going in a straight line. Um, and that is, uh, well, one is the exponential, uh, either increase or decrease. Um, and I can... Uh, uh, give you a hint that that's not the right answer. So that leaves only one other type of curve, and that is a sigmoid curve. So ben, again, um, just like many other things that we've seen already, or, or at least two, um, the the oops, sorry, the uh, the, uh, the 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 uh, grazing rate uh, expressed here as cells eaten per copepod per hour increases roughly linear as we increase uh, add more and more prey. Uh, phytoplankton to uh, to the to the bottle, but at some point it's going to max out. I, I think it's I hope that's pretty intuitive that that um, many processes would follow this type of uh, curve. So prey more prey faster rates until it maxes out. And here's just some data to illustrate that some real data a little bit old but um, still um, indicates the point. Again, prey concentrations here measured as diatoms uh, uh, per mil. And the ingestion rate is just the number of cells that are eaten by a copepod per hour. Calanus is a kind of a very uh, well-studied genus of, of zooplankton. One uh, genus that I want you to uh, name that I want you to, to uh, learn and memorize. So again, we see this increase in prey um, rate, in, uh, uh, predator rate, the, in, the ingestion rate, and then it levels off. And I guess... Um, one reason to, sh to show this is just how messy these data can be. Um, that's just the fact of biology and the difficulty of doing these experiments. Um, but you can see it's roughly um, constant after a certain point. 
Um, yes, there's an equation that's sometimes used uh, to describe this as something like a michaelis menten equation, um, but I won't go over bother going over that for this for these data. Um, so as you may guess, um, that relationship changes over time uh, between, uh, in this case, spring and summer. Again, um, some old data, uh, but just illustrates how, again, we see the same trend of linear increase of rates uh, on the ingestion rate, and then it levels off. Uh, here we see that this changes between spring and summer, and, uh, and what seems to be happening is that these organisms are getting uh, more accustomed and, and uh, adapted to using higher concentrations that are present in the summer, so they ramp up their maximum rate of grazing, such as much higher in the summer as opposed to the spring. Okay, so that is one thing that's part of the uh, functional response. So um, that is, they, they change their grazing rate depending on the prey concentration. So you can think about these functional responses as basically what's happening immediately with this set of, of, of animals that are already present in your bottle. You can measure this in a day um, or less if you do the experiment properly. And that's in contrast to the numerical response. The numerical response is how the, the number of organisms, number of predators, number of zooplankton change. And perhaps their size also changes with response to, in response to, well, we'll see, prey concentration again is important, but also temperature and other factors are important in, in um, modulating the numerical response. Functional response, immediate. It's happening to these animals right now, today. Numerical response is something that's going to happen over longer time scales, days, weeks, perhaps even months. And it's going to affect the numbers of these zooplankton. Um, not, it's not something that's just happening um, to the existing zooplankton today. So in order to understand the, uh, the numerical response, we have to look a little bit more detail at the life cycle of copepods. And I think I mentioned this already, that copepods have a bit more interesting life cycle and lifestyle than what we have seen for the zooplankton. Basically, um, it's a little bit of over, so oversimplification, but uh, basically the phytoplankton divide asexually. Um, that is, they may have a sexual uh, part of their life cycle, but it's really not the norm. The norm is asexual, just a fission. In contrast, the copepods have a bit more interesting uh, life to them. They produce um, eggs, um, and I mentioned this, this is a picture I've used before. There's the egg, egg sacs. And then they have these various stages of development. And these are two words I think are worthwhile for you to know, uh, nopilus and the copepidite stages. So the copepidites look almost like the adults. There is a copepidite or pretty close to one. It's not necessarily for you to, not necessary for you to know that there are six stages for this particular copepod. Um, just, just remember, uh, the nopulus and the copepidite. The nopulus stage doesn't look too much like the adult, as you can see there. It's going to be much smaller and, and look different than what you see in the adult. So anyway, it goes through these stages to 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 uh, before it gets back to the adult. So, and I mentioned, I think I mentioned this to you before, um, is that these organisms, that there's a male and a female, and they actually have a little bit of a bit spicier lifestyle than, again, the asexual Phytoplankton. And this diagram kind of illustrates the mating behavior between uh, female and, and male copepod, again, our favorite genus of copepod, Calanus. Um, and this is taken from the uh, one of those textbooks that I recommend that I take a look at. And it shows the, the mating ritual between this male and female. Um, and as illustrated and talked about here in the uh, caption, it says that the female kind of uh, sinks down through the water column, probably only millimeters, centimeters, and leaving a trail of uh, basically per, uh, a perfume. And the uh, male basically comes across this this uh, trail of uh, pheromones, you know, a chemical cue telling the male that uh, she wants to find a mate. And he does a little dance, a little courtship there, um, about 20, 12 centimeters across, uh, you know, not not too small, uh, even the size of these organisms being millimeters in size. And then he basically follows her down. Um, sounds pretty romantic. Um, he bumps her, she moves, he follows, and then eventually there is an embrace. And then, well, Miller kind of ruins it by a more technical, stromatophore 
uh, uh, transfer. So that's basically the sex life of copepods. So a bit more complicated um, than what we've seen so far with regard to other uh, the other microbial organisms that we've talked about. So of course, what the whole point of that is to um, lead to egg production. And so there's various aspects of, of uh, egg production and growth. And this is all, again, part of the numerical response. I'm not going to be able to write it. Let's see if I can write it here. Numerical response of these, of these animals. So it's, of course, it starts with the number of eggs. Then those organisms have to hatch and grow. And then they have to go through the various um, life uh, stages. In, in, in the case of the copepods, through the nopulae and the copepidite stages. And so what's, what are the, those stages dependent on? Well, again, prey concentrations. And it's a very you know, complicated graph to illustrate a very simple point, uh, point. I think about almost how much work must have gone into doing this graph, all the days. I'm, I'm sure some graduate student who did it. And basically, it it's, um, shows that you know, they, they basically um, looked at egg production by, by this, again, this Calanus uh, femarchicus uh, animal. Uh, and one they just kept with food, and the other one they 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 didn't uh, they they starved for a period of time right here. And surprise, surprise, without food, um, the uh, the Calanus female stopped laying eggs, and then um, uh, it almost immediately, it's 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 I think the the, the uh, interesting thing about this is how fast the uh, you know the drop off occurred as soon as they stopped feeding, um, whereas of course. In, during the same period, um, there was no uh, drop off in egg production. And what's perhaps a little bit also surprising is that um, uh, uh, that the uh, it took some time before the animals to, to to start to produce eggs again. Probably because they were um, pretty uh, you know bad shape after going without food for what ten days or so. So anyway, food concentrations, prey concentrations have a big impact on on uh, egg production. So uh, again, this is the same thing. And this just basically shows, again, our favorite curve, um, indicating that um, you increase the amount of chlorophyll, which is, again, of course, a measure of biomass uh, of the phytoplankton, and you get more eggs. And w at, at some point, though, it levels off. Nothing too uh, astounding there. OK, another factor that's going to impact egg production is just simply temperature higher temperatures, um, uh, more eggs. Um, whether it's an exponential, which is implied here, or more of a linear curve, that's not quite that important. What's important is a simple observation is that when things are warmer, um, there are eggs are, uh, egg production is higher. Uh, the only caveat to that is look, notice the temperatures are fairly low, um, certainly lower than what we see in our waters. And so I'm sure if, we, if the experiment was done out at higher temperatures, eventually you'd see some type of uh, uh, leveling off and maximum temperature, you know, who knows, maybe 20 degrees, and so when it skips up to 30 degrees, uh, probably this animal's not too happy. This this animal is more of a uh, polar uh, zooplankton species. But anyway, the point here is that higher temperatures lead to higher egg production. So those are the numerical response uh, uh, of how growth is changing, uh, response to food concentrations and temperature. Um, now, the other thing I, I mentioned was the fact that the animals get bigger. Um, these are, again, um, uh, whereas a lot of the phytoplankton, basically, they're one size, and that's the end of the story. Um, these copepods can change uh, and get bigger um, over time as they get more, um, more food again. And again, we see our very similar curve that we've seen now a couple times, where we see a, a change in the growth. Um, and this level off at the maximum uh, concentrations. Um, notice here that they use this term growth rate, um, and that's basically the same type of uh, 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 per capita, or in this case per um, biomass change in the in the uh, in the mass um, with respect to time. And it has units here. Of, well, it has units of percent per day, and it really should be just per day. But anyway, the point here is that increases with more food and then levels off. And again, you see this in impact of temperature higher at uh, 15 degrees uh, than versus 12 and 8. 
So that's again another example of the numerical response of, of this animal to, in this case, um, growth um, uh, in, in response to food concentrations. And again, we see temperature has an impact. Same thing as before. Now we see that temperature has more of a linear impact on, on growth rate. P, P over B is basically a per, uh, the ratio of production to biomass. And if you think about the units of this, uh, it would be a good little exercise for you to think about what the units are. Um, I think I I'll, I'll, I'll won't give you the answer um, and, and let you think about what those units should be. They don't give them here, and that's unfortunate. Um, uh, uh, but um, so they, they, they do have units. Um, one hint is that it's per capita change. Anyway, you see that it's increasing with time. They're growing faster in, with warmer waters. No big uh, deal there. Okay, now this is a bit more um, uh, complicated. And, and we're going to return to this issue um, in a couple lectures after we introduce some more organisms to the oceans. Um, and that's about time lags. Um, and so what's implied by the previous graphs is that as soon as you added more food, and we saw that for egg production, as soon as you took away the food, um, basically egg production went down to zero. And we did see now a little bit of lag when the food was reintroduced to the animal. They didn't produce eggs right away. It took some time for them to make eggs. That was a case of the animals being um, starved. Here's a case of some data showing that there's this lag between chlorophyll A, which again, you remember is a measure of phytoplankton biomass and egg production. And the point here is that that peak in chlorophyll A is a little bit later, or I mean, sorry, it's a little bit before the peak in egg. Now that one is right on top of, e of each other, but here's another peak in chlorophyll A, and then the peak in egg production is a little bit later. So the, so the point here is, is, that, um, is that there's this, um, although there's certainly a, 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 a response of the animal to chlorophyll A, that is phytoplankton biomass, it's delayed. Um, and one other thing I like to mention here is that this is all connected to the spring bloom. So here's in, in you know, St. Lawrence estuaries up north in Canada. So spring comes late there. So their spring is in June. And we see this, this the spring bloom there in this peak of chlorophyll. And then we see the general response of this calendus uh, species of zooplankton uh, a little bit later to the chlorophyll to that increase in phytoplankton biomass. So I want, I want you to tuck that away for a bit and think about, we'll, have, we'll return later to why that's important in thinking about the control of phytoplankton and the control of the whole uh, food web um, in the oceans. So in, in thinking about the legs, it's important to keep in, in, in mind the time scales of, of how fast these organisms grow. And so you should know already what the generation time of phytoplankton are or the doublings per day is another word that we've used. Do um, you remember what that is? Yeah, it's about a day or so. So they double about every day, or, or their growth rate, is, growth rate is about 0.7 or so per day, close enough to one. So it's one. Time of an egg to adult, you can see there, is quite long. Um, I mean, well, I guess this depends on your perspective. You know, for, for many organisms, 20 days, 100 days is, is, is a blink of an eye. For us, of course, it's horrible. Um, but for these animals, it's not too bad, 20 to 100 days. Certainly, it's a, the point here is a lot longer time scale for growth uh, for the zooplankton, these zooplankton at least, um, than the phytoplankton. And so that's also important to keep in mind in thinking about the legs. Uh, and, and the question I'm going to leave with you and we're going to return to is could these guys, the big guys, the macrozooplankton, and actually what I've called in other, in other slides, the mesozooplankton, um, control phytoplankton, um, even assuming they could eat them? And we'll answer that question um, later. So just to review, the factors controlling the functional response of grazing, um, size is really crucial. The taste of the prey, that is the chemical composition of the prey, certainly the outside uh, composition, and the numbers of prey. In terms of the, uh, the miracle response, um, that's the factors, that's the response of the organism in terms of egg production, the growth of the individual animal, um, and development, moving from the 
nopulized stage to the capepatite to the uh, to the adult stage. That's all numeric responses. It's happening over a much longer time period. It's happening to more than uh, necessarily more than just one organism. These these organisms, you could do this experiment to measure these things in a day. The number of predators or number of zooplankton do not change in this in when you look at this the functional response, but they certainly do or can change when you look at the numerical response. I mean, the the, the, the hint of that is given in the name numerical. Um, and the factors impacting the numerical response or eliciting a numerical response include prey concentrations and also temperature. Okay, so now let's step back and look at the different size grazers um, that we see in the ocean. The macrozooplankton, um, again, I, I like to use the words meso. I'm going to put this in the, in the um, uh, modified, revised, corrected um, PowerPoint. Um, they're the biggest. Micro is next. Um, and, and because this is a size category, not necessarily a taxonomic one, we can see that things move from one category to another or can't. So the copepatite and the, the uh, nopuli stages of a, of a say, of a copepod, which as an adult may be in the mesozooplankton category and be rather large, millimeters, even centimeters size, their juvenile stages, the copepatite and the, and the um, um, the nopuli stage may be in a microzooplankton uh, uh, size category. So that is, it has implications for what they eat in terms of their prey. Their prey has to be necessarily smaller. And that means that they're changing their position in the food web um, as they go through the developmental cycle. So moving down, and, and also another set of uh, microzooplankton includes ciliates, real important group of organisms. Um, also heterotrophic dinoflagellates. Now, We've mentioned this already. Dinoflagellates are really, really curious group of organisms. We talked about uh, the fact that some of them are um, are toxic. They they make up toxic phytoplankton blooms. Um, not all of them are necessarily toxic. Um, uh, some of them are, are quite good members, so to speak, of the phytoplankton community. They contribute substantially to prion production. But there are others that are heterotrophic. That is, they don't carry out uh, photosynthesis, and they are just like or they're analogous to the to the other members of its size class in terms of the zooplankton. They're, they're card, good care, card carrying zooplankton. And then moving finally down in size, we have the next group of organisms that are smaller than 20 microns, um, which are include proteas and protozoa. So basically, we'll see in a moment, proteas include protozoa. Protozoa are basically animals of their proteas. So again, we come to this um, diagram and Ignoring for now for the, 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 the things off the line, we look at this, this predator-prey relationship, and we have to find now organisms that are able to grow and eat the prey that are small, really small size here. And those prey include some of the most abundant organisms on the planet. And we've talked about this already, that in oligotrophic waters, such as the North Pacific gyre, um, it's the, the smallest phytoplankton um, that are make up the, the vast the bulk of the prime production, um, maybe 50% or so of the prime production. And you, and you should know the two genus names that I've told you to remember, Prochlorococcus and Synchrococcus. I won't try to write it all out. Synchrococcus and Prochlorococcus are two genus names for two types of cyanobacteria that are really abundant in the pico phytoplankton um, size category. So these organisms are small. They're less than three microns or two microns in size. And they're, and they're making up a large fraction of the biomass that we see in the open ocean. Um, this is a, actually a pretty poor picture of a Cyphococcus. They don't, they, they're really single cells. And, you know, these are really clumps of cells growing in culture. Um, uh, just something to illustrate. They're basically little dots that are not that exciting to look at, unfortunately. But they're really important in terms of um, counting for prime production in the oceans. So the question then is, who's eating these guys? So we have the, all this phytoplankton in, in, in the water, in the oligotrophic um, uh, um, uh, oceans. And, and, um, and we need some, and you know already that if, if they're growing on the order of a day, um, they would quickly fill up the ocean. So we have to have something to kill them off. And we talked already about various uh, processes that could kill off these organisms. Um, but as you may guess, um, there has to be grazers um, that eat these organisms. 
and you should be able to predict their size um, because you I've told you that the size just by the names you should be able to figure out their size their size is less than two microns in the case of the picophytoplankton and that implies that the grazers have to be on the order of 20 uh, uh, microns in size or so now that's a little bit of exaggeration some of these grazers can be th as, as small as three to ten microns in size but the point is they're small also so the question is what are those organisms and those the main organisms of the picoplankton which include the bacteria and and small phytoplankton are are what we call nanoflagellates i'm going to show some pictures in a minute so they're heterotrophic um, nanoflagellates sometimes abbreviated hnans um, they're small ciliates they're dinoflagellates we talked already about heterotrophic dinoflagellates um, and there are also other mixotrophs and, and we'll end um, in a few minutes with uh, what I mean by mixotrophs. All these organisms are, are, are what's referred to as proteas. And proteas are single cell eukaryotes. That's all they are. It's a kind of a, I don't know if it's a very fancy word, but it's um, a word to describe single cell eukaryotes. All these are proteas. In fact, most of the phytoplankton that we've talked about are proteas. If they're single cell and they're eukaryotes, they're proteas whether they carry out photo, uh, photosynthesis or whether they're heterotrophic. So what do these guys do? Well, already I mentioned that, that some, many are, are good card carrying photoautotrophs. They're members of the phytoplankton community. So the cyanobacteria, are they proteas? Are they proteas, cyanobacteria? No, no, they aren't because they're, they're not eukaryotes, they're prokaryotes. So, but there are a whole bunch of other um, single cell uh, phytoplankton out there, and those are all proteas. Others are pathogens. We're not going to talk too much about pathogens in this class, but many pathogens that um, you may be infected with. Um, Giardia is one of them. Um, malaria is caused by a, a protease. Um, and this is the word pro protozoa, I think I'll pop it up in a minute, um, is used more commonly for things that cause um, malaria. Uh, uh, but proteus is more general term and favored by um, some of my colleagues. Pisteria is a is a is a proteus that is thought to kill off fish and, and form har harmful algal blooms. Although um, kind of controversial organism that we uh, well unfortunately we won't have time to get into. Um, and then finally, they can be strict um, uh, 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 heterotrophs that that graze on these smaller organisms. And so here the word protozoa. Um, uh, may be appropriate. Uh, you have to be careful with that word because um, you have to know that it's only carrying out heterotrophy and it's not capable of photoautotrophy. And in the oceans, we don't often know that. And so the, the word that's used is, is proteas. So the, the protozoa, that strict heterotrophic protozoa, are again just grazers. Um, and they may eat other phytoplankton um, or they may eat um, other protozoa that are only slightly smaller than themselves that is made, making them carnivores and then finally there are mixotrophs that do a little bit of both so let's look at a few pictures of these guys the ciliates um, as the word implies they generate uh, they can they can um, uh, swim through the water column although not fast enough to go against currents they're still plankton and the whole point of swimming is to get water moving uh, in order to get uh, in contact with more prey. They're usually bigger than the flagellates um, and they feed on phytoplankton and heterotrophic nanoplankton. So there's a picture of a, of a ciliate, a pretty big one, 25 microns in size or so, and there's this little cilia coming off of it. And this is stained with a stain that, that stains protein, FITC. Um, so you can see there, there's an example of a ciliate. Um, here's a pretty spectacular ciliate, which is about 50 microns or 100 microns in size. Can't remember exactly. Again, the same thing. All the cilia sticking off here. Lots of it sticking off of the end of this microbe. And here's some flagellates. So flagellates get their name because they have one or two flagella sticking off of here. Um, generally, these are much smaller in size than the ciliates. Um, as, as small as maybe one is a little bit of a exaggeration, two or three microns in size. Um, and there's one in real life, again, staying with this protein stain. There is a little body. You can see quite, quite clearly um, the two flagella sticking off of, of, of it. 
So the, again, the, the ecological roles of these organisms, um, uh, they can be strict phytoplankton, strict photoautotrophs, um, they can be pathogens, they can be strict heterotrophs, um, in which case they may eat other um, uh, herbivores, or uh, they can be herbivores, they, they, they eat other, uh, they eat phytoplankton, or they can be carnivores, which, um, you know, implying that they're eating the herbivores, they are eating the phytoplankton, or they can be a, probably a mixture of both. Um, and as I mentioned, um, uh, they can be also mixotrophs. They can, they can do both. And that's one reason why the word protease is, is generally uh, favored and used in the marine literature rather than protozoa, because often we don't know exactly what they're doing. So they do both phototrophy um, and uh, heterotrophy. And there are various flavors of this. Um, so again, their, their basic um, uh, mode of life is they, they're able to eat um, um, other organisms, so they're heterotrophs, um, but they also can gain energy by by phototrophy. So there's again a whole variety of these organisms, ranging from those that have basically are mainly phytoplankton that may eat uh, one or two other microbes, probably more for um, uh, for the nitrogen or phosphorus that those prey have. To another extreme is that uh, something that's more of a heterotroph that may eat a phytopla uh, a phytoplankton and keep the chloroplast around for a bit. These are called, these are called a kleptochloroplasts. And those chloroplasts from the um, ingested phytoplankton uh, will remain functional for, for at least some time and provide some food and keep on photosynthesizing um, until they finally uh, run out of steam. And I hope that um, jogs some memory cells in your brain because we talked a little bit about this with regard to the endosymbiotic theory, uh, theory for explaining how eukaryotes uh, evolved from bacteria. And so, as I mentioned uh, during that discussion, that occurs every day in the ocean. Um, and it's only once back, or uh, probably a couple times back, um, you know, millions of years ago that it rose, gave rise to these new uh, types of organisms, completely type, different type of organisms, the eukaryotes. But as I said, it occurs every day where a basically a, a protease-like organism um, that's a heterotroph will ingest a phytoplankton, but not completely break it apart and, and totally destroy it. It will retain the chloroplast for some uh, period of time and benefit from that chloroplast continuing to photosynthesize and, and provide it with, with um, organic carbon. Um, and so you can imagine that um, this really kind of complicates things, to, to say the least. And modelers hate these, these type of complications, things that are easily fixed, uh, uh, easily uh, put into one simple black box. Um, uh, but in fact, that's what the microbial world is all about, is these organisms that carry out many different processes. Um, and, um, you know, they're basically trying to make a living and survive by any way that they can. And that's, again, one reason why we use this word protease um, instead of pr uh, uh, protozoa because of the, the fact that they are able to carry out these different modes of, of metabolism. So that does it for today's lecture, and we'll move on to talk about other members of the microbial community on uh, next week.